It was a funny sight to see Mahler coming out of the opera here with... Uh, jerked? Jerked, yes. His whole body? Not his whole, but his, I think his left leg. He always had his hat in his hands. It was, was not possible to go with him step by step. He always took three normal steps and then a short step. It was a nervous condition. He always did one, two, three, and then a shorter step. Everybody looked at him, even when the people wouldn't know who it is. Everybody uh, turned to that, who is this fool, you know? He was always in thoughts when he walked. I always thought, you know, when I saw him walking, I had the feeling that he was uh, conducting or composing. His face was that of a neurasthenic. Sharp eyes with his glasses, his hair was disorderly almost unkempt. There was something in his look which was absolutely fascinating. And there was something sterling in his personality. There was something saintly about Mahler. You see, this you felt. That was a great face. It's a great face. Beautiful. And you know the eyes through the glasses. It was, it was impressive, of course. Every great face is impressive. I was at the conservatory then, studying violin, and when we all heard about Mahler, we were excited. And in Europe, or especially in Vienna, you know, the audience felt part of the performance, and they felt justified in just coming down and just meeting him and telling him and getting together and talking things over. And Mahler 
he liked that too, and he'd enjoy a war to talk things over. Do you recall uh, going up to him and asking him a question? Well, I must say, I know I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I thought uh, what I admired about him was his music, and I thought my idea of him was better than what I might see. <laughs> <laughs> when he came to New York, of course, all the German press, New York Staatszeitung, and uh, they came to greet him. And uh, they asked him uh, something. I said, oh, I've been in Bami. I'm a Bohemian. Mm -hmm. They didn't like it because... They wanted him to be they a German. They wanted to say German. Uh -huh. He didn't say he was German. After seeing, so to say, the outside of it all, and especially musically, I was intrigued to see what he really does. So I joined the orchestra at a loss because I had a better engagement elsewhere and at the Philharmonic. They didn't pay so very brilliant. But anyway, I didn't care about that. I, I wanted to see what he does. And see how it went together. Yes, just the technical part of it. We start to rehearse the Spring Symphony by Schumann. And uh, the introduction, you know, it comes out so naive, so plain, you know, but out of clear sky, he burst out a lit just with tiny little hands, his tiny little figure, you know, burst out and scared everybody. We hit it. That I never heard such a sound in my life from that orchestra. Terrific. And you didn't expect that? No, we didn't expect that. Uh -huh. Not that was the first time. Uh -huh. We never expect anything like that. Of <laughs> course, in a concert, he got everything he wanted. Because the, really, the orchestra loved him. Because we learned so much from him. Oh. Anybody who wanted to learn something, you know, must love him, you know, because mm -hmm. after all, he was terrific conductor, uh, even though with his bad beat. His beat was not good. No. Oh. It, it, it wasn't like the real Germans. They do one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know. It's, that wasn't that way, you know. It was just a rhythm. Ah. That's pure expression. He meant it, he meant that this way, a big accent, and it was supposed to go down. And he went up. Yeah, he went up. <laughs> Didn't make any difference to him. But that, we understood because we had an notes in front of us naturally. So you got used to him soon enough. Oh yes, in couple of rehearsals, you know, we didn't need his hands at all, except the interpretation. When he was at the Metropolitan, I played a few performances with him, like the Bartered Bride. The principal second violinist was also the personnel manager, and he sat right close to Marlow. And Marlow had a habit of dropping his arm, either from fatigue or uh, thinking of something else. He'd drop it right down under the stand. And uh, this uh, Mr. Rothmeyer used to say to uh, Mr. Marlow, used to say, Herr Marlow, den Stock her, you stick a little higher. I remember he had a run in with the oboe player. He says, uh, Mr. Marlowe, he says, uh, we don't understand your beat. It's hard for us to know what to do. So he says, good musicians, he says, don't need a conductor. A conductor is only a necessary evil. And he says, uh, don't worry what I do, just play your music. Musically, he did the most surprising things in the world. Is that now, for instance, Till Eilenspiegel. At the end of it, you know, the D clarinet, that funny sounding high clarinet, mm -hmm. when he's hanged, has the cadenza to go way up. And my God, Marlis says, no, we don't want D clarinet, we want a plain clarinet. I think we were doing uh, Don Juan, and he added some bells or something like that. He added just a few notes somewhere. He says, you see, when Strauss wrote this, he was a young man. Now, he says, in Salome, he, he would orchestrate differently, he says. Now take in Beethoven symphony, he had the E flat clarinets in there, such a half sharp instrument, and he put that in the Beethoven. Oh my God! For instance, in the last movement of Beethoven's Eroica, tam 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 tam. Now he added an E flat clarinet to that to give it a shrill sound. He said that was a, a Hungarian tune and it should sound like uh, gypsy like. Yes, he was reckless in that respect. He just did what he thought it should be, not what it was. Because he was the first one in this country, I think, who wanted double woodwinds. For in, Beethoven. For Beethoven or uh, even Brahms or certain compositions where he wanted the 
woodwinds to come through because, you know, in the old days they had a, such a small wind section. He didn't like Tchaikovsky, which is strange. When we uh, played the uh, pathetic, in the last movement, there were some descending scales about the middle of the movement. At the end of the scale, you know, there's a sudden pause. And he says, see, is this symphonic? <laughs> then he gave us a speech. He says, you see, Tchaikovsky was a very talented composer. He had beautiful melodies, but they were really Italian melodies, he says, on the Italian style. Nice music, but he says it's not symphonic. He figured it was uh, like an Italian <clears throat> opera. You mean that part that goes... Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And in the concert, it's this what passion, the Russian light and shock. Sarcastically. Wouldn't think that possible, would you? He didn't want anything mechanical. If you saw him person in the orchestra playing, you know, out of corner of his eye, he'd stop and say, You play that passage for me. Uh-huh. And he'd pick out an elderly gentleman in the second violins to do that. You can imagine. And in fact, I remember one time a friend of mine, a contrabassist, and he was a dear fellow, but he had kind of a little rheumatism, you know, and he couldn't handle the thing so well, you know. Mm. And my God, was I horrified one day. He stopped and he says, you! And there was my friend there oh, with rheumatism. And it was just cruel. <laughs> <laughs> I even remember his name was Kissenberg. And he said, now you play this alone. And the man said, I'm very sorry, Mr. Marler, but uh, I'm too nervous now to play. He was quite an elderly gentleman. So, so, right. so he went back on his podium, conducted. After about a half an hour, he stopped the orchestra and he said, Are you still nervous? The man said, Yes, I am still nervous. And about another half hour, he stopped the orchestra. He said, Are you still nervous? And the man said, Yes, I am still nervous. Okay. At the end of the rehearsal, the first thing the next morning, before anyone else could play or anything, he said, I'd like you to play that passage now for me. The man said, I didn't sleep all night, and I am still very nervous. And I am a good player, but I just can't play alone tonight. Well, he stopped him three or four times during that rehearsal, and the man couldn't play. So he said, you know, you have no business to play in a symphony orchestra. You should be playing in the back room of a saloon. I was second bass player, and I got an offer which paid practically twice as much as I was getting. So I asked if I would be released from the contract. No, of course I wasn't released. So when Mahler came, he fired a couple of musicians, and I said to myself, here is my chance to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, he demanded absolute silence. Yeah. Then he saw anybody talking to neighbor, he said, uh, in German, Peter Brue, shouting it, see, which means, please silence, only it is not so polite, like in English. <laughs> oh, I turned to my neighbor and talked to him, and he shouted at me in German, frecher carrot, which means fresh guy and so on, see, but uh, I just left, you know. Well, the rehearsal started, and we rehearsed uh, Mahler Symphony, see, came the second movement, and the basses had some difficult passages, and Marr stopped, says, the bass is alone. And I tell you, it was incredible how it sounded. So Marr said, you play it alone. And you play it, you play it, you play it. And he took all eight bass players. And after he took them, he turns to Rislaud, the manager. And he said, and you told me you had eight bass players here. He so says, yes, we have. Mara said, that's very mistaken, my dear sir. You got C- seven Schuster here and one bass player, that's that fresh guy. <laughs> Something Marla could never stand was a indifferent tone, indifferent music. No, he said to us, where music is, the demon must be. Demon. For instance, I remember the clarinet player, a very wonderful player, and Marla always thought the world of him, and yet... One day, you know, you said, piano, piano, but yesterday you said it was too piano. And so Marla explained to you, well, you know, it all depends on our mood. It's all mood. Yesterday, probably I thought it was too much. Today, 
I think it's too little. You know, he, in that respect, he was human. You know, he just explained it, that it's all mood. That's one thing that Toscanini never had. They, you can praise him to the sky, but that inner sensitiveness he lacked completely, I think. He got from his orchestra everything that he wanted, piano, forte, crescendo, but I, I noticed playing with Mahler, you know, and I saw Toscanini up there sitting, I thought, now my good man, now listen to something that comes from here, not only from terrorizing the people. Oh, yeah. But of course, Mahler terrorizes the orchestra, oh, but, but, you know, that was something to hear. If you do your duty and do it well and do it with your heart, he has nothing against you. He wasn't too happy with the Philharmonic Orchestra. He'd fly off the handle very often. No, 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 that is not the way to play it. He says, in New York, they play different. Uh, I, it's different in my ears. I hear different sounds than what I'm accustomed to, you know. He thought he was conducting the Vienna Orchestra or something. Well, that brings me to something that I could never understand. But, you know, he's a Viennese, and, you know, Strauss and all that. His fourth symphony, his theme is... Da, 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 ti, da, da. My God, he asked all the first violins to do da 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 do e. Aha. That. I remember that. Mm -hmm. He insisted on certain slides in his music. Sometimes in a slow uh, movement, in other composers, he would too. For instance, he said you couldn't go da da. Uh, Nobody sings like that. So you have to slide to get there. He would sing that for you that way. Well, how else would you play it? He'd say, breathe, breathe, or that's one of the French, English words he knew. He'd say, uh, stop, breathe, breathe. Just like you sing, you know. Would he make the sound actually stop between yes, phrases? Yes, absolutely. For mm -hmm. take Meister singer, dee, da, 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 da. No, see, and that brought a clearness and an ensemble. That's very important. See, yeah. that's uh, almost insensible, but it's just enough to make it uh, sound natural. Just because it isn't quite natural, I would say, it makes mm -hmm. it sound natural. Mm -hmm. He knew the style of the composer. For instance, Toscanini would conduct everything dramatically, whereas Mahler conducted the music, I think, nearly as much as the composer intended it. Toscanini was Toscanini, irrespective mm -hmm. of the composer. In a lot of works, uh, Mahler wasn't that way at all. In some uh, Schubert works, there was jolliness, and there was, even in the uh, sixth Beethoven, the country dances and all like that, we really was jolly, whereas at Toscanini, he was just waiting for that storm to come up. The second movement, you know, those void calls toward the end of the second call, he says, it must sound like this. He tried to whistle between his teeth, and it sounded very funny. <laughs> the flute player we had that time was in the he says, I know in Italy they eat these birds. <laughs> <laughs> he was always temperamental, that is to say, he never was indifferent, just, just calculating director, but he always wanted the atmosphere the live imagination of the few musicians working. Well, for instance, the third symphony in F major, and uh, the last movement, you know, is da 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 Yes. And he says, now, gentlemen, you see, that's like cloudy day, not sunshine, cloudy, a little bit, and so on. We played the nuage in the clouds. He used to say, uh, that must be played like a mist. Now, he says, gentlemen, don't misunderstand me. He says, I don't mean garbage. Mist in German means garbage. He <laughs> says, because the, anything I say goes to the press, he says. <laughs> Flexibility. That's what Marla had. There must be a certain uh, liberty in the temple. Phrasing. After you take note of the initial marking, then you must do your part. Would you say that the tempo variations were wide? Oh, just a, just a shade. But it's the difference between freedom and, and slavery. Uh -huh. A shade. They say that no two bars were the same tempo. But well, there you are. Uh -huh. And yet it was the same. 
So it's a certain freedom that you think, well, this is well, this is not going to go together anymore because so much. But it's, it, it catches up, and within its thing, it just quivers within it, and it keeps in the tempo, mm -hmm. no matter where it is and what it is. It's what the composer demands, what not what the composer, but what the what his composition demands, and he impart that to his musicians. His musicians should treat that too. He made short rehearsals. Physically, he couldn't stand them, and he used to make a remark. In German, he'd say, after the rehearsal, Alles hat eine Ende, bloß eine Wurst, die hat zwei. Everything has an end, except a Wurst, that has two. Oh, that atmosphere, that's something that, that's what made the man outstanding. My God, he didn't make any show of the man. He always had his hands right next to his body, and that's all. And if you wanted something to come out, he just kind of make a little movement, and that's all. Nothing for sure, and uh, that's why rehearsals never were long. They didn't seem long because there was always that atmosphere of uh, we're making music and we want to make better music and we want to make lovely music and we want to do justice to what's being said in music. Yeah, but not are we here because we're going to get a check after seven days. Yeah. That's a man. Uh, I was shocked at some time how he jumped at people and how he uh, fixed up scores and parts, but I mean that part of him, you know, as a musician, gigantic. If we would uh, rehearse upstairs sometimes, we couldn't get the main hall. His wife and daughter would come in, always looked at them, always smiled. He was always so happy to see them. Must have been a good relationship there. And she was a very gracious lady, Mrs. Mauer. Beautiful woman, blonde, rather tall, Reminded me of Madame Jaritza. What was most striking type. about her? Her uh, personality, you know, spoke beautifully, you know, charmingly. Very nice woman. And she had her daughter Anna with her at that time. The little, she was a little girl at that time, maybe nine or ten years old. I remember him very well. I was nearly seven when he died. But my memories are not anecdotes. Are nothing to say. They are that I remember his voice. I remember his hands. I remember his walk, his very strange walk. I know exactly what it was because I walked with him. What People say like? it was a nervous tick. It wasn't. It was irregular, but it was a change of pace. Every few paces, he just changed. He shifted gears. He shifted, yes, that was all. Why did it? I don't know. It was uh, somehow nervous, apparently, but it was not a tick. It was not, you know, it, it just shifted. So I walked with him as a child often, so I know these things. And I remember these terrible lunches, you know. I wasn't allowed to speak, and he was always absorbed and uh, thinking about other things, and we had dreadful food. <laughs> Anyhow, it appeared to me so. But I do remember when he suddenly took notice of me, the complete change, and as if it were a burst of warmth. And that I remember so well. It didn't happen often because he didn't have time, but, but suddenly he, he took notice of me. And the change in the face, these are my memories. It is so strange that I really only recognize two or three photos. The others are cold to me and could be any, you know, and they are suddenly, oh, that, that is the memory. It is so personal. Of course, it is always the, the pictures of the very last time when he was, my God, old. He was 50. Nothing. But he really? was old in some way. He was so spent. He was really lined. He was... It was a dramatic face in his last, last year. And the pictures that you recognize are the ones that dramatize that yes. particular period in yes. his life. And also this, this little smile. I mean, he had a most lovely smile. And so warm, but from this mask-like behavior, you know, this sudden burst is, is maybe my main memory. I mean, for instance, uh, one, one thing, I always sort of, you know, fiddled about and, and I had a pair of scissors and I cut into something. And then Mummy, you know, said, mm, 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 did you do that? I said, no, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> and I 
light and I light. And I was sitting in the sitting room in this lovely... And Mala came in. And he knelt down. And he said, well, don't you think that the scissors might have suddenly moved? And I said, yes. And you couldn't do anything to stop him? No, well, there, I mean, there, of course, I confessed, you know. <laughs> well... I knew there was another story. Well, there you are. I mean, <laughs> but, I mean, uh, this is not, this is not a story, but it's just, you know, I mean, that, how can you describe this? I mean, uh, I, I, I can see it in front of me, I know it, but these things can't be said. It's funny that uh, we played some concerts at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and uh, he never took a cab into town or somebody had sent a limousine for him like they did for something. Like he used to take the subway into town. Uh-huh. Yeah, as I was, uh, was in the same car with him, and, and I just uh, tipped my hat to him. He looked at it. I don't think he recognized me. He had very poor eyesight. But he'd see things that you wouldn't think he saw, you know, sometimes way in the back. <laughs> <laughs> of the orchestra. Yes. Uh-huh. He never could get enough volume out of us to play the first movement of Beethoven's Fifth. He always wanted more and more, like a cataclysm, a, I don't know, volcanic eruption. He wanted something that we really couldn't give him. Well, one day, he finally got what he wanted. And he was really delighted, genuinely delighted. And he invited the entire orchestra to have a little... Uh, after concert snack with him. Oh, very friendly to everybody. Very nice, my God. Just a good colleague. He never cared to speak of his experiences, though. Marlon never used to talk about his past. He thanked us, and uh, he hoped we'd all be together a long time, which, of course, didn't. He only conducted a year and a half. He had to go back to Europe, and then the concertmeister took over spearing. Do you recall uh, Mahler's last concert? No, you? not exactly, because, of course, we didn't know it was his last concert. He never showed up again. He took ill and stayed away for, I don't know, maybe a, a week or so. On, not even a week, because he came in a day or two before the concert he had to conduct. And he said, uh, well, he said, uh, of course, we are not... Uh, really ready with this composition yet, but he says, I don't want to keep you gentlemen later, because uh, on account of my sickness, I don't want you to suffer for it. And he didn't call for any overtime or anything, which he was entitled to if he wanted it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I think a week or so later, uh, he, he took really ill, and uh, that, that was the end of it, and he went back to Vienna. Did he show it uh, in his last uh, concert? No, he, he pulled himself together. He, was, he had that iron willpower. Real professional actor. Yes, attitude. real trooper. Why, my dear sir, we didn't realize that he was such a sick man, no. And then he was composing all the time. Do you realize that? You see what willpower he must have had. Yes. That he didn't show it. Do you ever recall speaking to him at all? No, I really didn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Curious. Did he know I, I, that you had followed him from Vienna? Did yeah, he... yeah, that's it. You know, I said, I, I, I thought I'll go up and say, well, Herr Director, I remember what I thought, my God, what would that mean to him to tell him I was in Vienna when he conducted? So I... <laughs> 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 if it was something important, you know, well, it just seemed so trivial that I, well, I thought, well, I'll let it go. So he never knew. <laughs> you know, there was a big letdown in the Philharmonic after uh, Mahler passed away. There was a big letdown for a year or two. Personnel? Like for ten years. It's funny, in the basses, there's somebody called Malik. <laughs> Malik, he died, he died long ago. He was a fine bass player. My goodness, you know, I come to think of it. There's very few of us left. Now the rest are, the rest are gone. I, I don't see anybody else here. Only all of them gone. It's not strange. They're all, all these people are gone now. <laughs>